So let's see inside of uh, Cinema 4D. Uh, Crypto appears in three major areas. The first one is obviously the render settings dialog where I can find Crypto on the list. And you can assign it, and when you select it, you get a bunch of tabs. And we'll go through all those controls and talk about what they do. The second place is on the plugins. You see the Krikatoa uh, entry, and I can detach that one and uh, probably even put it over there. So I have my uh, controls uh, visible. And basically, this creates various objects. Uh, some of the objects are the ones that I mentioned, Kit and Order, and all the uh, uh, mesh conversion objects, and also the sources, which pass the data from uh, the crypto sources uh, to crypto. I mean, possible crypto sources, that means uh, uh, thinking particles, emitters, X particles, and uh, turbulence. And the third area where you can uh, find uh, a crypto is in the tags. So if I would go and create an object, for example, a sphere, and then I turn that sphere to a PFD volume, and I'll hide the sphere in the viewport so I can see the particles appearing. I can then right click on that object and add a crypto tag. And you see that we have a bunch of channel operators. These operators deal with copying, uh, scaling, and setting the values of particle channels. We also have one that uh, deals with the um, remapping of uh, channels for the texture mapping. That means defining what to be used for mapping coordinates or positions and what to be used for the output of the various channels of uh, materials in Cinema 4D. Um, as I mentioned, we have a camera tag, a mesh tag, which turns meshes into matte objects, and the rep repopulates uh, particles tag, which procedurally converts particles into more particles. So these are the various uh, major areas uh, where I can find crypto. And instead of rendering this, I mean, I can render the sphere if I want to. Right now, crypto is assigned as a re the renderer. If I would try to render it now, nothing uh, useful will really happen because uh, we don't have a light source. So you see, it's actually everything is black. If I would go into the render settings in the options and enable the background color and render again, you'll see that it's actually a black sphere on blue background. So lighting, illumination is really important for crypto. We don't do default lighting because it never really looks right uh, unless you specify an explicit light source. and deal with where it's located and what the settings are. Now at this point, if I would render, something will appear there. It's really dense, looks a little bit like the Death Star. Um, and so the reason is the density of the particles, uh, it's coming from the PFT volume, is really high. And it's blocking the light very early. That means that the light hits the first particles and then doesn't really penetrate into the volume much. And you start seeing more air effects because the distribution of the particles currently is in a grid because I use the PT volume without enabling the jittering. If I enable the jitter, the particles will be distributed more diffusely, but you'll see that if I render now, uh, it will still be very noisy and it looks like concrete or something. In order to change this, I can change the density of uh, the incoming density of the particles. I can scale the density that's coming, uh, or I can go into the render settings and scale it for the whole scene. And that's what we usually do. In crypto, you go into the lighting and rendering pass controls, and here you can uh, take the incoming data for the density and adjust it, basically scale it. Instead of taking it one to one as it coming, you can reduce it. And actually the default settings uh, for the density scaling are 0.5. And it's expressed as a scientific notation, basically 5 times 10 to the power of minus 1, which is 0.5. If I set this one to 0, any number to the power of 0, uh, is equal to 1, so that results in the result, in the value of 5 uh, for the uh, multiplier for, this, uh, for the density. So minus 1 was what we were using so far. If I go to minus 2 and render again, obviously the density will start getting less. And if I go another order of magnitude down, 0 0.005 and render again, it will get too transparent and you start seeing the background and it's kind of bluish but also a lot of light passes through the object volumetrically. So in order to preserve the original look as it was, but also pass exactly the same amount of light through it as I just did with the minus three exponent, I can decouple the uh, density for the lighting pass and for the render pass, go to minus three here, and when I render now, more light will pass through the object, but the object itself will become more solid and doesn't reveal the background as much. 
A fourth place where I can deal with crypto is the console. It's actually the script console, but we are outputting information during the uh, rendering. So our log goes there, and you see that we are currently rendering a half a million points, which is nothing really to write home about. It's uh, using 13 megabytes of RAM to fit those particles. It takes about 1.3 seconds uh, to render these particles. Of course, I can add more particles, but instead of doing this, I'll actually go to a much more interesting interesting scene, uh, which is also my uh, go-to scene for uh, this type of presentations. You've probably seen it already several times. Uh, and uh, that's the, the Buddha statue. The Buddha statue is very useful for actually uh, testing um, complex geometry uh, with volumetric shading. So that's why I'm taking this model. It's from the Stanford Library uh, of uh, models that you can download from the internet and it's been used in scientific papers and pretty much everything published at SIGGRAPH typically uses a Buddha or a dragon. So there are um, two things that I have to do again. I need lighting. This time I'm going to actually change the settings of the light to be a parallel spot and I'll uh, change this to uh, 500 uh, outer radius and fi 500 also for the inner radius so it's really there is a hot spot there. Um, I'll turn it again to purity volume. I'll hide the mesh so I can see the particles again. I'll check the checkbox to enable the jittering. And um, I can now start in actually increasing the number of subdivisions. And I'll talk a little bit about the settings, what they do, and what is happening there. Um, the purity volume uh, creates a voxel grid around the mesh. Basically, it converts it to a level set. And the resulting voxels are then filled with one or more particles. When the jittering is off, only one particle is being created in the center of each voxel. And if I start changing the viewport settings, you'll see that it's resampling the mesh on the fly, creating new voxels and filling with more particles. Uh, and the settings for the viewport and for the renderer are actually separated. That means that at render time, it will be using two centimeters voxel size, but in the viewport, in order not to make it too slow, because I will be generating like millions of particles, here I'm creating only a few thousand. And I can display them as larger dots in order to look a little bit more solid. If I start now increasing the subdivisions, each one of those voxels will be subdivided once or more times. Um, and the subdivisions are currently uh, not enabled in the viewport, so just increasing that one doesn't change anything unless I check the checkbox. Then I see that if I do the subdivisions, more and more uh, particles will be added um, to uh, the um, voxels that I'm filling. Basically, uh, when I enable jittering, I also have the ability to add multiple particles per voxel. So I can go here and say five in each voxel, and that uh, jitters more and more particles inside. Now I have 10, and so on. And this is another way to increase the number of particles. Uh, it's a bad idea to go very low with the voxel spacing. Once you capture all the detail that you need in order to see the shapes of the geometry, and two centimeters is actually a pretty good number. If you go down to one, the result will be the same as going one subdivision up uh, from zero to one, but it will be slower to render because the conversion of a mesh to a voxel grid uses ray tracing and that uh, is obviously slow. So uh, let's actually render this quickly. Uh, we'll go switch to Krikator. We'll make exactly the same changes as before. I'll actually enable the background uh, um, to be uh, blue and to go one order of magnitude down here and uh, let's see if the settings that we have actually produce anything. I'll render to the picture viewer. And looking at the script console, we see that we produced 5.8 million particles and rendered them in about 5.8 seconds. So that was pretty much 1 million uh, per second to uh, illuminate, actually generate them first, then illuminate them, and then draw them. So here I have now a setup where the light is passing through the Buddha and so on. <clears throat> and I was talking about the settings here, about the drawing. And you see that in addition to the density, we also have those filters. And by default, the drawing filter is using uh, bilinear filtering. If I switch this one to nearest point, I'm going to uh, come close here and render the whole thing again uh, with the nearest filter. And the nearest filter is fitting one pixel only from the final image. It's actually much more pixelated than when it's filtered. 
So uh, there are very rare cases where you want to actually use the nearest point. Uh, most of the time you'll be using the bilinear, and you see that the bilinear also has a filter size. The default is one. In that case, each particle is covering two by two pixels, and if you start going up with that value, it's going to fill more pixels, and it will start looking a little bit like uh, uh, blur, uh, the Gaussian blur in, for example, Photoshop would produce similar results. It will start getting smoother. So looking at this, comparing to this, it's actually getting smoother. We also have a bicubic filter, which doesn't have a filter size. It's always three by three filters using bicubic interpolation, and that also produces slightly smoother results than the bilinear. So if I would render this one and compare, you'll see that it's uh, um, also a little bit smoother than the first uh, version that we made. Not by much, but it's slightly different filtering. This is interesting because if I keep this one at bilinear and one for the drawing, uh, draw point filter, I can actually uh, switch my self-shadowing filter, which is also using a kind of um, an image buffer and drawing attenuation maps there in order to calculate how the lighting is affected by the particles. If I switch that one to bilinear, normally when I'm rendering with bilinear filter one, I'm going to get relatively crisp shadows. So if I render now, uh, it will be actually slightly more crisp than in the original. Uh, won't be very obvious, but there is a little bit of a difference between the two. Now, if I wanted to blur those shadows, I can actually increase this. Let's set it to something extreme like a five. So each one of those particles will write into the attenuation buffer with uh, a lot of sampling around. That means it will be the sample range will be five, and it is also a little bit slower to draw. And if you compare now, let's make this buffer B and make this buffer A, and you see the difference now in the in the lighting. It's actually diffusing it more because uh, the filter uh, in the um, self-shadow filter, basically, the filter size is relatively large. Let me switch that one uh, back to bicubic as it was. And the other thing that we can draw, we can render the, instead of particles, we can render voxels. And the voxels right now say, I'm going to use a voxel size of two centimeters. I can render as it is, but actually the voxels are a grid of boxes, as you know, in space. So it's a bad idea to use jittering in that case. It's actually better to disable the jittering and potentially even disable the subdivisions and render much less particles. And in this case, we have two centimeter spacing in the PT volume and two centimeters uh, in the voxel size. So we'll have approximately one particle per, per voxel. If I render now, it won't be very smooth. You might actually see some artifacting uh, in areas where the, the voxels are pretty much stepping around. But I can actually deal with this in two ways. I can either uh, increase the number of particles or have multiple particles per voxel to smooth it out. Or I can increase the filtering, which then samples the nearby voxels and takes them into account uh, while drawing the current voxel. So uh, if I do this, uh, the result will be voxel rendering that is smoother than the previous one you'll probably see that this is slightly more defocused. Uh, and I can continue with that. Um, I can do many things. For example, I can increase the uh, voxel size here to four, make the voxels very big, and that will further diffuse the result. So if you're rendering something that should look like a cloud, uh, you can increase the filtering, and you can also increase the um, voxel size and make it uh, much less uh, detailed. And this is very difficult to achieve with point rendering. That means if you had to create something that looks like a cloud out of many points, you would have to create millions and millions of points. And right now, in the console, looking at it, we are creating less than a million particles, 724,000, let's say 725. Uh, but because we're using uh, real-world settings for the voxel size, we can go at huge sizes and lots of filtering, or probably even less filtering, um, just using a very large voxel, and that will diffuse it. You start seeing a little bit of artifacts where it's uh, filtering, because I reduced the, uh, the, the filter uh, radius. 
but in general, uh, this is very useful when you have to fly to a cloud. If you create uh, a volumetric cloud out of particles and render it in point mode in Krakatoa, when you come very close with the particle, uh, to the particles with the camera or try to fly through the cloud, you start seeing individual particles passing by. You see the individual points. So if you're doing a dust storm cloud, for example, then it makes sense. If you're going to do something that has to uh, be solid when you fly through it, you want to fly through the clouds and still see clouds all the time, the voxel mode is your friend, and that's why we actually added it. We want to render volumetric effects uh, that you can fly through. With. In general, it's a little bit slower than the particle rendering, but uh, it typically requires less particles in order to fuel the pixels. Uh, so um, very often they actually scale very similarly. So instead of adding a lot more particles, in this case we just uh, play with the voxel size and use less particles to render slightly slower but get the same result. 